Welcome to this video. We will do an experiment where we investigate what sorts of things affect the amount of air resistance objects feel. So far, when we've studied projectile motion, we've operated under the assumption that every projectile is in free fall. That means there's no air resistance. In this lab, we are going to inspect uh, and consider now for the first time air resistance. Air resistance, it's also called uh, air friction, and it's also called drag. So here are the three things we will investigate. We're going to see what's the impact of mass, of mass on the drag, or the air resistance. What's the impact? of the surface area, or the area, let's say, on air resistance. And the last thing is, what's the impact of the initial velocity, the initial speed, we'll say, or the launch speed on air resistance? Each of these things we'll find impacts how much air resistance an object feels. You are going to figure out what the impact is. So to start out, Open up a new browser in Firefox or Chrome or Internet Explorer and type in FET, P-H-E-T, and then do projectile motion and hit enter to search. The first one that you see is what you want to click. It'll take a little bit to load. And then you click the play button. See that big play in the middle? Okay, great. And here's our simulation we'll be using to collect data. Now, the other thing that you're going to need is Excel. So hit the Start button, and then uh, type Excel, and choose it from the program list. And then Excel will open. And then, something that will help out is uh, the following. On your keyboard, I want you to click the Windows button right there between Control and Alt. Hold it down, hold down the Windows button, and while you're, you know, so first make sure Excel is the active uh, window, make sure you're like in Excel, then hold that Windows button down and hit left arrow, and it snaps Excel into the left side of your screen. Then click on the projectile motion simulation, um, so once you snap it in place, you can let go of all the buttons on the keyboard. Then you click on the projectile motion simulation, click, uh, push and hold Windows, on the keyboard, and then hit the right arrow on the keyboard, and it snaps this into the right side of the screen. So if it's over here, bam, you snap it into the right side. If you want to snap it into the whole screen, you do Windows Up, but we're not going to do that. We're going to put it on the right side. Okay then, here's the simulation, and here's how you proceed. All right, first we will do the, uh, first we will adjust the diameter and see what the impact is of diameter on how far forward the projectile travels. That's the game. So look at this, look at the simulation here. You've got the cannon, and if you cl click and drag it, you can change the angle. And if you want to know what the angle is specifically, you come up here and you look at angle. Now, uh, you have to check the air resistance box the first time that you get to the simulation. Check that air resistance box. There it is. And now you've got some extra uh, values here. We will leave altitude at zero the whole time. OK, the first thing we do is set our controlled variables. Theta, we want to be 45 degrees. So if you come into the angle box over here, whoops, come into the angle box, you can actually just type in 45. And now it has the angle that you're looking for. And then you hit Enter, right? And it changes to 45 degrees. The initial speed, we're going to fix the initial speed. Whoops, I didn't put down that as one of my controlled variables. The initial speed is going to be vi equals 25 meters per second. Whoop, Miss Kohler, please contact the office. Okay, uh, so make the initial speed 25. We are going to leave that at 25 degrees. And the mass is going to be set to, uh, what did they say, 15, 15 kilograms. The drag coefficient down here, 
make that four. Right. Okay. And you see there's a fire button and an erase button. And then there's values up here, but they're all zero right now. I'm going to hit fire. I'm going to start out with my diameter at 0.1 meters, which is what's shown. And I'm going to conduct trials increasing from 0.1 all the way up to 3.0. And I'm going to increase at equal intervals, equal intervals. I'm going to conduct at least 10 trials. Okay. So I hit fire. Whoa, that thing's going really far. Has it landed? No, let's, let's zoom out and see. Here's the zoom button. There we go. So what's the range? How far forward did it travel? We call that the range. It was 60.0 meters. So I have to record this in Excel. So what do I do? I Let's see, I set the diameter. I chose what value of diameter to use. And this is actually going to be like this on your computer. I chose the diameter in meters. In column headings, you always put the unit in parentheses. And then right here, uh, when I chose the diameter, I found there was a particular range. And range stands for how far forward it traveled. Now the diameter, wait a second, where'd my meters go? It's hidden. I need this column to be wider. So here's a great trick. You bring your cursor between B at the very, very top and C. And you get this double arrow. See that? Pointing in both directions. You, When you see the double arrow icon, you double click and it automatically adjusts the width width to fit the text. So double click and it adjusts the width to fit the text. So my diameter, I set it at 0.1 and the range that I got was 60.0. And you want to include, you want to show the value exactly as it's shown. So 60.0. You hit enter and, oh wait. You hit enter, and it looks something like this, right? The point .0, you do 60.0, and the point .0 goes away. So here's what you have to do to get that point .0 back. There's a button right here under number that says increase. If you hover over, it says increase decimal. You click that, and you increase the decimal, but we just want 60.0. Okay, we come back to the simulation. You can erase this trial or record over it. The next diameter is, let's say I'm going to increase by point, you know, I'm going to increase by point 0.1 every time. So I go from point 0.1 to point 0.2, then to point 0.3, but this is wrong. You're going to have to do something different. So I hit fire, and when I have a diameter of point 0.2, point 0.2, how far does it go? 49.2 meters. Look at that, it doesn't go as far. Interesting. And I take trials until I get down to 3.0 meters. I keep going. Now, you don't want to increase your diameter by 0.1, right? If you increase by 0.1, it's going to take a really long time to get all the way up to 3. Way more than 10 trials. It's going to take, like, many, many more. Um, 30. But you have to figure out what the interval should be for diameter in order to get to 3.0 meters as your final value in like roughly 10 to 15 trials. Okay, I'm going to pause the video and collect some data. Okay, so here's the raw data I came up with. And look, you can see all of my projectiles here, all of, all of the trajectories. Um, and here it is, but whoops, 30. That should be 30.0, so let me fix that. Oops, there. The next thing we're going to do is uh, we are going to... Um, we want to know what's the impact of diameter, but really what we want to know is what's the impact of area on the range. If we change the area, how does that impact the range? We don't have area values, so we are going to calculate them and we're going to add a new column. Right? Add a new column with area. Let me center it. To get the area, we are going to input an equation into Excel to calculate it for us. Now we're just going to use, this is going to be fine for our purposes, but we're actually just going to use the surface area. Um, that's not entirely correct, but that'll work for our purposes here. So what's the surface area? Well, it's a sphere, you may have noticed. The thing that you're launching is a sphere. So the surface area of a sphere is 4 times pi times the radius squared. Right? So here's what you do. To tell Excel that you're about to enter an equation, you hit equals in the cell. And then you do 4 times, which is the star, 
And then to do pi, you type pi, open, close parentheses, just like that. That's how you, uh, that's how you input pi on Excel. And then you have to multiply by the radius squared. So you might think, okay, it's 0.1 divided by 2, that's the radius, but I square it. We are not going to do this. Let me tell you why. If you do it this way, you have to enter, right, if you hit enter, you have to go and create this exact same formula for all of these cells, and there's a trick. Watch this. I'm going to do equals 4 times pi times, whoops, star, and then instead of putting 0.1 divided by 2, I click on the cell containing 0.1, and then I divide that cell by 2, right, oops, and then I square this. B3, this cell B3, which is highlighted now, is called a reference. When I control C, copy, and then click and drag, and then control V, paste this into the cells below, the reference changes. In this cell, we're using that diameter. When we move the uh, formula down, we are using the uh, 0.3. Right here, we're using 0.4. Right here, we're using 0.5. So Excel changes the reference for you based on where you've moved the uh, formula. Now I'm going to give this a reasonable number of decimal places. Maybe just two is fine. I like to center it. And the next step is to add a graph. So you hit the insert button up at the top on the ribbon, insert, and then from charts, you choose this one with the dots. No lines, just dots. That's the scatter plot. And you choose the first scatter option. Right. Now, hopefully nothing will appear. Um, if you put your, if you put your, you know, cursor on one of the numbers and you insert, then it'll have some stuff filled in. So here's what you do. If you have stuff filled in, you right-click on the graph, and you hit Select Data. Right-click, and it's halfway down, Select Data. You click what's there, and you remove it, because it's almost always wrong. So I hit, I click, I remove, I click, I remove. Now I'm going to add my own series. The x values are the independent variable, which is simply what we, uh, the independent variable is simply what, uh, what we were changing in an intentional way, so diameter. The y values, you highlight this and delete, and then you click and drag the y values, which was the range. That's what responded. Okay. You hit OK, you hit OK. You hit the plus, add your axis titles, and add a chart title. The chart title can be experiment one, and this is just our raw data. We click series one and we delete it. For the axis title here, on the x-axis is the diameter, and on the y-axis is the area, uh, no, the range. And that's our first graph. Then you do the same thing, but you put area on the x-axis. Because while it's good to have raw data, I also want to know what's the impact of area on the range. That's our goal, right? We want to see what's the impact of the area on the range. Okay, so then you make another graph, and let me do that and show you what it looks like. So here's my next graph. I still have range on the y-axis. That was my dependent variable. That's what responded to the changes I made. But now I'm putting something I calculated, area, onto the x-axis. And I've changed my title then to process data, still experiment one, because these are values that I calculated, not the raw data that I collected. So there it is. There's my second graph. It still is experiment one, but now I'm showing data that I calculated, process data. Area was a calculated value, not a raw data value. We're going to put all of this into a Word doc. You can introduce each table and also each graph. To copy a table, you hit Control c and then you come over to uh, Excel, I'm sorry, to Word, and you hit Control v And then you can change the formatting, move it around like this. And the same thing can be done with the graphs, Control c But when you paste the graphs, hit this Control and paste it as a picture. 
and then input all of your material this way. 